Good morning. Chapter 30, Adventures in a New Country. We now resolved on a more extended survey, and early one morning our caravan set out. After walking several hours, we reached the outskirts of a small wood. The spot was tolerably cool and well sheltered. On the right was an over, overhanging rock, while at the left a river emptied itself into a large bay. The place appeared to be safe and convenient, and we began the necessary arrangements for a prolonged stay. I decided to take the three elder boys with me the next day in order that we might explore the broad plain or savanna, which we had seen on a former occasion from Prospect Hill. My wife and Frank were to remain at the tent with the wagons and the animals. Starting for the unknown land and taking the narrow pass between the river and the rocks, we arrived at a spot from which the entire plain could be seen spread out before us. Beyond it rose steep barren mountains piled one above the other, their summits reaching to the clouds or sharply defined against the sky. Leaving the verdant plain behind us, and continuing towards the mountain range, we found the contrast increasingly perceptible. The grass was burned, and the land appeared dry and unfruitful. The soil, evidently rocky and sterile, required frequent rain to soften it so as to produce vegetation. On we walked, the air was sultry, that means hot, and most oppressive and my poor boys seemed to lose all courage and power of endurance. At last, when quite overcome with heat and fatigue, we reached the foot of a projecting rock and threw ourselves down to rest in its grateful and acceptable shade. We had not been resting long and had just produced our provisions when Fritz, who had his eyes fixed on something in the distance, exclaimed, Papa, what is that in the valley yonder? It appears like a man on horseback. And there's another, and a third, he added. And now they're all at full gallop. Can they really be Arabs of the desert? No, certainly not, I replied with a laugh. But take my telescope and make out exactly what the strange sight is. It is most curious, Papa, said the boy. The moving objects look like herds of cattle, loaded wagons, or, or wandering haystacks. What can they be? The glass was passed to his brothers, and both Ernest and Jack declared the great moving objects to be men on horseback. <clears throat> I took the telescope myself and discovered at a glance that the figures were gigantic ostriches. The birds were evidently approaching us. I desired Fritz and Jack to call in the dogs and search for the monkey. While Ernest and myself concealed ourselves, Master Nip, it appeared, had scented water and the party had refreshed themselves at a hasty bath and filled their water flasks. All this time, the ostriches were drawing near. There were five of them, and one I saw was a male bird, as was shown by the large and beautiful tail feathers and the deep glossy black of the neck and body. We must not startle them, I said, lest they begin to run. How do the Arabs catch them? asked Jack. Sometimes on horseback, but oftener by stratagem. When it finds itself pursued, the ostrich will run for hours in a circle of immense circumference, and the hunter keeps within the circle, but still follows till the creature flags from fatigue. Then, crossing the circle, he makes the capture. But hush, do not move. The birds are very near us. Coming upon us so suddenly, they appeared to be startled, and unfortunately the impatient dogs escaped from our hold and rushed yelping and barking upon them. Away they flew like the wind, seeming scarcely to touch the ground with their feet. Fritchett had covered the eyes of his eagle when the birds were first alarmed, and it quickly pounced upon a beautiful male bird, which was a little in the rear, and with one blow of his beak brought the creature to the ground. We were too late to save his life, for the dogs were quickly upon it and we arrived at the spot only in time to gather up a few of the most beautiful feathers. There's the ostrich and the eagle. What a pity to kill such a beautiful creature, said Fritz. Why, he must be six feet high, at least. 
or his neck would measure three feet more. What can these birds find to live upon in this barren and unfruitful spot? said Ernest. It is said that the ostrich can digest almost anything, I replied, but his usual food consists of grains, plants, and shrubs. Most animals, also, that inhabit the barren regions of a desert can live for days without food. Continuing for a walk towards the valley, which I had seen in the distance, Ernest and Jack turned aside to follow the movements of the dogs. All at once they stood still by some withered shrubs and beckoned excitingly for us to follow. Ostrich eggs, ostrich eggs, cried the boys as we overtook them. And at their feet in a hole in the sand, exposed to the sun, lay 20 eggs as large as a young child's head. If you've never seen, they're, they're just huge eggs. What a glorious discovery, I said, but do not disturb the eggs, or perhaps the mother will forsake them, for she leaves her eggs during the day. At night, she sits on them, covering them carefully. The boys begged me to take them, to let them take home two eggs to show their mother. I cautiously lifted two from the top and then sat up in the sand a cross made of two pieces in the heath steam stem by which to find the nest easily when we should come again. Turning our steps homewards, we were glad welcome awaited us. We arrived just about sunset at the tent.